Hey guys, it's Daniel. Welcome back. Jim Morrison is one of the most iconic musicians in the history of rock and roll. The story of his adult life is well documented. But what about his childhood? What about his adolescence? Jim Morrison had a really interesting upbringing. Over the years, Jim Morrison's family moved to various locations in the U.S. due to the fact that his father was a military man and was deployed to different locations. The constant moving around had a profound effect on Jim's development and made him, in a way, suited to the lifestyle of a rock star, of having to move to different locations, being on tour. That kind of thing came secondhand to Jim. He also became somewhat reclusive as a person because since as a youth he was bouncing from place to place, his social circle kept changing. And so one of the only constants in his life was himself, his own company. He spent a lot of time alone reading and writing poetry, and this alone time was what helped in a lot of ways develop his artistry. The fact that he had somewhat of an unstable upbringing is actually a lot of the reason why Jim Morrison became the artist he became. So often when it comes to the stories of these rock stars, whether it's Jim Morrison or others, you'll notice that they had childhoods that were not quote-unquote normal. And I think in order to really appreciate and understand the full picture of what made Jim Morrison Jim Morrison, we have to look at his childhood. And so with that said, I want to read to you guys a segment from the Jim Morrison biography, Jim Morrison Life Death Legend by Stephen Davis. Quote, Anyone inquiring more than superficially into Jim Morrison's life immediately realizes that the story of his childhood is crucial to understanding what happened to him later. First, he remained very childish his entire life. Of course, for rock stars who came to fame and fortune very young, what else was there for them to do? Second, when Jim joined the Doors and began performing in public, he abruptly severed all ties with his family and never saw his parents again. Third, his early act was a graphic, pull-no-punches rewrite of the ancient Oedipus legend, in which he sang of killing his father and sleeping with his mother in front of tens of thousands of his fans. Why did Jim Morrison hate his parents so much? Why did he hate himself? How was he able to create such pure American music out of his own anguish? Why did he end up with a crazy girlfriend who was an even heavier character than himself, who tried in vain to control him, who may have killed him in the end? How could it have happened that this cool, talented guy, one of the great artists of his generation, morphed into a monster and then immolated himself? The problem with answering these questions is that Jim Morrison's troubled and problematic post-World War II childhood within the sheltered, close-knit world of military families has been one of his story's most closely guarded mysteries. His parents, Admiral George S. Morrison and Clara Clark Morrison, have never commented publicly on their notorious firstborn son as of the time of this printing in June of 2005. Jim's brother and sister have been equally reluctant to speak of their brother. Whether fear of scrutiny or a desire for privacy drives this steely reticence, any inquiries to the Morrison family concerning the late rock star and poet Jim Morrison are parried by California attorneys claiming to represent his estate. The Morrison's family wall of silence has mirrored Jim's childhood, especially his tense, unhappy adolescence, since the day he died. This shouldn't be surprising, since Jim Morrison tried to convince the media that his parents were dead, and that his siblings never existed. He probably thought he was doing them a favor. Here's what is known about Jim's first 20 years. His father, George Stephen Morrison, known as Steve, was born in Georgia in 1920 and raised in Leesburg, Florida. The Morrison family was descended from Scottish settlers who arrived in America in the late 18th century. The name Morrison is thought by some scholars to derive from the Latin root of Moorish. In Roman times, soldiers from far from provinces were moved around to guard different parts of the empire. Thus, Celtic troops from Britain would be sent to guard Morocco, while Moors from North Africa maintained order in Britain. Folklorists say, for example, that the quaint English custom of the Moorish dance can be traced back to a Moorish antecedent. In this context, Morrison could mean Moore's son. Late in his life, Jim would visit Morocco at least twice, searching for something he was unable to describe to his traveling companions. Steve Morrison's parents were hardworking, God-fearing, non-drinking Southern Presbyterians. And Steve followed the family's tradition of military service and entered the U.S. Naval Academy in the late 1930s. He was a trim young man, short of stature and serious, with an air of quiet authority. With World War II about to begin, his class was hustled through an early graduation in 1941, and Steve Morrison was posted to Hawaii for flight training. Later that year, just before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, he met Clara Clark at a military dance. Blonde, bubbly, very pretty, and slightly heavy, she was the daughter of a Wisconsin lawyer and political maverick who defended union activists and had run for political office as a socialist candidate. It is interesting that Jim Morrison's maternal grandfather came from the great populist, progressive, socialist strain of American radicalism a powerful sector of dissent 
and anger that challenged the two-party establishment from a strong political base in the upper Midwest and produced national leaders like Robert LaFollet. After a brief and war-torn courtship typical of thousands of young couples in that dangerous time, Steve Morrison and Clara Clark were married in April of 1942. They moved to Pensacola, Florida, where Steve continued flight training before shipping out on a vessel laying mines in the waters around Alaska. Their first child, named James Douglas Morrison, was born in Melbourne on Florida's Atlantic coast near Cape Canaveral on December 8, 1943, amid the greatest burst of military energy his country ever experienced. He was called Jimmy by his father, an answer to that name all his life, at least to those who knew him intimately. His father was soon flying Hellcat fighters in the South Pacific and spent the next 18 months on duty. While her husband was overseas, Clara lived with her husband's parents, Paul and Caroline Morrison, who operated a laundry in Clearwater on the Gulf of Mexico. Jimmy lived in his grandparents' house until he was three, and Clearwater remained the family's hometown of record during Jimmy's childhood. Steve Morrison emerged from the war a decorated Navy pilot and an ambitious officer devoted to his career. His first post-war assignment was in Washington, but, determined to rise in the naval hierarchy, he moved his young family around with very little notice as he earned promotions and his assignments changed. Correctly guessing in 1947 that quick advancement lay in the new technologies that were reshaping the world, Steve Morrison transferred into nuclear weapons systems in the period when the hydrogen bomb was being developed at Los Alamos and tested at the White Sands Proving Grounds in the deserts of New Mexico. His new duties required a high-level security clearance that specified that his work was never discussed at home. Obscured by official secrecy, references to Lt. Morrison's duties during this period are still heavily censored in copies of his naval records made available to the public. All that is known about this era is that the Morrison family lived in naval housing in the vicinity of Albuquerque. Jim's sister, Anne, was born there when he was three years old. If his sister's arrival was traumatic for the quiet, only child, something else happened in New Mexico that left a profoundly vivid impression on Jimmy. Early one morning, the family was driving in the desert somewhere between Albuquerque and Santa Fe. According to Jim, his mother and father were in the car along with his grandparents. At one point, his father pulled off to the side of the two-lane road, and he and Jimmy's grandfather got out of the car. Jimmy looked up and saw the grisly remains of a very recent head-on collision between another car and a truck carrying some Pueblo or Hopi Indians. Scattered on Don's highway bleeding, as he later famously remembered. Dead and injured people were lying on the road, and from somewhere rose the anguished voice of a woman wailing in pain and hysteria. Fascinated by the bloody spectacle, Jimmy tried to get out of the car to follow his father, but his mother held him back. So Jimmy pressed his face to the window, taking in the gory aftermath of the fatal accident. His grandmother blurted that she'd always heard that Indians didn't cry, but these people were wailing in anguish. Jimmy shuddered and strained to get a last look at the carnage as his father climbed back in the car and pulled onto the road again. A few miles farther, they stopped at a filling station and called the highway patrol and an ambulance. Jimmy was visibly disturbed and kept asking questions. He got so upset that his father finally said, Jimmy, it didn't really happen, it was just a bad dream. But he never forgot the dying Indians. It was the first time I discovered death, he recounted many years later, as tape rolled in a darkened West Hollywood recording studio. I'm just this little, like a child is a flower man, whose head is just floating in the breeze. But the reaction I get now, thinking back, looking back, is that possibly the soul of one of those Indians, maybe several of them, just ran over and jumped into my brain. It's not a ghost story, man. It's something that really means something to me. After this encounter on a desert highway, Jimmy began to wet his bed at night. As an adult, he remembered going to his mother's bed when it happened and being forced to go back to his room and sleep in wet sheets. Shame city. He tried to hide it when it happened, but she always found out. Then, he started to be afraid to sleep in his own bed at all. Some nights, he fell asleep curled in a ball on the floor. The bedwetting may also have been connected to a childhood bout with rheumatic fever, which Jim told his doctor about in 1970. This illness might have, additionally, weakened Jimmy's heart. If Jim Morrison's trusted lawyer is to be believed, Jimmy was introduced early to sexuality. In 1969, while preparing for the obscenity and lewd conduct trial that could have resulted in a prison term for his client, Beverly Hills attorney Max Fink debriefed Jim Morrison on his sexual history. According to a transcript of a taped interview later conducted by Fink's wife, Margaret, the lawyer said that he asked Jim why he had chosen to expose himself on stage in his home state of Florida. I thought it was a good way to pay homage to my parents, Jim replied. Taken aback and mindful of the abyss that seemed to separate Jim Morrison from his family, Fink then asked what his parents had done to him. Jim reportedly mentioned the bedwetting trauma, then let slip that he'd been molested by a man when he was a boy. Jim refused to tell Max Fink who molested him, except to say it was someone close to the family. 
When Jimmy tried to tell his mother, Fink claimed, she had gotten angry, called him a liar, and insisted such a thing never could have happened. Fink said that Jimmy began to cry as he told him the story, and claimed that Jim had said that he could never forgive his mother for this. For the record, the Morrison family's attorneys categorically denied that any of these incidents or this alleged behavior ever occurred. In 1948, the family moved again, to Los Altos in Northern California. Here, Jimmy Morrison started public school as a shy and chubby boy who hated getting on the bus in the morning. Cold War paranoia was in the air amid fear of nuclear attack by the Soviet Union. School children of Jimmy's generation were indoctrinated about the omnipresent threat of thermonuclear annihilation and required to practice duck and cover routines during monthly air raid drills, sometimes squatting under their desks, sometimes lining the darkened halls of their school buildings to be beyond the range of shattering glass as phantom A-bombs pulverized their world. Television, viewed on tiny 7-inch black and white screens, made a deep impression on Jimmy. In second grade, Jimmy and his buddy Jeff Morehouse, another son of a Navy family whose wanderings roughly kept pace with the Morrisons, were avid viewers of Dumont's Captain Video and paid up memberships of his fan club, The Video Rangers. Jimmy's younger brother, Andrew, was born in Los Altos the following year, 1949. Then this fairly typical Navy family's transient wandering began in earnest. They went back to Washington, D.C. for a year before moving to Claremont, California, where they lived while Steve Morrison was serving in Korea. Jim attended Longfellow Elementary School. In sixth grade, he was a slightly chubby, asthmatic natural leader, the best kickballer in the school, and president of the student council, which required him to open morning assemblies by reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. But then Jimmy got in trouble. He was asked to leave his Cub Scout pack after he refused to follow directions and was unruly with the den mother. In 1955, the Morrisons returned to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where, family members recall, they noticed a change in Jimmy. He gave up his piano lessons and refused to spend time with the family. Living on the edge of the desert, Jimmy became fascinated with the mysterious, prehistoric-looking desert reptiles, lizards, snakes, armadillos, that scurried around the hot, dry landscape. The horned toads fascinated him, little scaly dragons with flicking tongues and nightmare eyes. He hunted them down, seeking their lairs, reading books about them. Desert reptiles became Jim's personal totem making dozens of appearances in his notebooks on their way to what became a national fetishization at the behest of the future Lizard King. In 1955, Commander Steve Morris was assigned to the aircraft carrier USS Midway, and the family relocated again, this time to San Francisco. They moved into a big shingled home in suburban Alameda, where Jimmy began the 8th grade amid the convulsion birth of rock and roll and the epic milestones of juvenile delinquency. Elvis censored on Ed Sullivan, Bill Haley's irresistible rock around the clock, Little Richard's Savage Jungle Rhythms, Fats Domino's Gut Buck New Orleans R&B, Chuck Berry's clever three-minute high school anthems, black leather motorcycle jackets, switchblade knives, a James Dean maelstrom of 1950s rebellion amid Eisenhower era conformity, repressed sexuality, and the political stresses and apocalyptic threats of the Cold War. Experts have long observed that some children of military families may be at risk for various problems, socially and psychological disorders. Military families are called upon to move often and on short notice. There isn't much time to cultivate friendships before the family moves on to the next post or assignment. In the Navy, with the ambitious on-the-move father often away at sea, the mothers did the bulk of the child raising and often had to cope with rootlessness, emotional disorders, and alcoholism. Jimmy's family moved four times before he was four years old. And this lack of stability may have engendered a physical restlessness and a sense of profound alienation that stayed with Jim Morrison for the rest of his life. The adult Jim Morrison often didn't know where he would sleep at night and he preferred it that way. Even after the royalty checks for Light My Fire started in 1967, Jimmy never owned a house or rented an apartment, preferring instead to live with girlfriends, crash in motels, or just pass out on the beat-up sofa at the door's office. Discipline was a problem for Jimmy, and the despair of his mother. Resentment, on the boy's part, was built into the situation. An ambitious officer had to put the Navy ahead of his family. It was the way things were in the services, and the families had to accept it. With his father mostly absent, his mother was the authority figure in the family constellation. She was all he had to rebel against. When his father came home from sea duty, Jimmy would overhear his mother complaining bitterly to his father about him, enumerating all his mistakes, malicious pranks, and screw-ups. Years later, Jimmy's friends wondered why he liked to throw darts at naked Playboy pinups, taped upside down on his bedroom walls. When his father was home, the atmosphere was often tense. Steve Morrison was known in the Navy as a charming, soft-spoken, forceful, and extremely intelligent man. At home, this battle-tested sea officer tended to bark orders at his children. Is it any wonder that 10 years later, his son created the Vietnam era's greatest anti-war song, The Unknown Soldier? <laughs> 
Jim's younger brother told interviewer Jerry Hopkins that Clara bossed Steve around at the home and was clearly the dominant personality in the family. Early on, the couple had decided not to hit their children, so punishment was dished out verbally, with, in Jimmy's case at least, lashes of guilt and shame added to the standard military dress-down. Andy Morrison said that while this would make him cry, Jimmy took this verbal punishment with dry eyes. Jimmy's behavior was a family flashpoint, with his mother as the lightning rod and designated scapegoat. In 1969, at a chaotic Doors concert in Seattle, a drunk and upset Jim Morrison waved the band to a ragged halt, stopped the show, and told the audience, I've been reading about the problems kids have with their parents. Yeah, that's right. And I'm here to tell you, I didn't get enough love as a kid. Intelligent and articulate, Jimmy also had a dirty mind and a vivid imagination, and he'd often blurt out things in school that got him in trouble. An early pastime was cutting up comic books to rearrange Donald Duck and Daisy in sexual positions with new dialogue. When Mad Magazine began publishing its surreal parodies and sick humor in 1956, Jimmy was an early subscriber. He read his issues of Mad Till the Pages Wore Out and tried to duplicate the harsh comic screams and outbursts that peppered the texts, driving everyone around him crazy. Jimmy's slouched deportment, extreme lack of eye contact, and sarcastic and insolent attitude drove his parents to distraction. His public antics, nose-picking, spitballs, snide remarks, embarrassed the family at Navy functions, and they soon learned to leave him at home when they could. Andy Morrison indicated that Jim began to bully his siblings when he was about 13. His brothers suffered the most. Andy would be watching TV, and Jimmy would lumber in, get him in a headlock, turn him over, sit on his head, and fart in his face. Or pin him down and let a gob of spit hang over his face. Outdoors, Jimmy would pick up a rock and tell his brother, I'll give you ten which meant Andy should start running. The little boy learned quickly that Jimmy wasn't kidding. He would throw the rock. In 1955, the Morrisons were on a ski holiday when Jimmy put his brother and sister on a toboggan and pushed off downhill, aiming for the side of a barn. The sled picked up speed, but Jimmy didn't break. Faster, faster. His sister started crying. His mother was shouting. A horrified Steve Morrison had to sprint to save his children from injury. Jimmy told his furious, disbelieving father that he'd only been kidding around. Conventional wisdom might nominate Jim Morrison as a poster child for the instability of military families. The lack of roots, the father's continual absence, the mother's uneven discipline, the difficulties that a bright but socially isolated child encountered in receiving approval from friends, teachers, and parents all can be used to explain Jim's urges to rebel in order to get the attention he needed. Yet, some observers counter that these peripatetic military families form a larger, extended family that often provides a secure enclave for its own and produces flexible, well-adjusted children. Military families often move together, and the women that kept these families going amid such dislocation often forged bonds that survive for years and even for generations. Jimmy Morrison was obviously exceptional, a piece of work, a pistol. No one could really control him. He was a kid with a rocket in his pocket. Early on, Jimmy learned how to push people's buttons to get the recognition he craved. Later on, as his father rose in the ranks and was able to spend more time at home, he reasserted his role in the family with a program of strict rules and discipline, which was deeply resented by both Andy and Jimmy. Several ideas taken from the fields of psychology and child development might help to illuminate Jim Morrison's behavior later in life. Attachment theory, for instance, suggests that children who receive insensitive, neglectful, or inconsistent care can develop difficulties with controlling their emotions and often turn to drugs and alcohol to soothe themselves. Such children often have trouble with trusting other people and maintaining consistent relationships, and may also become impossible to control. They often exaggerate their behavior to get the attention they crave, with negative attention being better than none. Insensitive or neglectful care can also result in young children relying upon fantasies of grandiosity to protect against anxiety. Some display a tendency to break away from their families prematurely. This independence can make them feel powerful and untouchable, as if nothing will hurt them. As they grow unprotected, they become self-destructive, accident-prone, and are often the victims of their own poor judgment. While no one can say for certain that Jim Morrison fit into all these criteria, the way he conducted himself later on makes anyone interested in him wonder what lay beneath his permanent state of rebellion. In 1955, Jimmy went to see James Dean in the movie Rebel Without a Cause. Rebel, directed by Nicholas Ray, was the archetypal juvenile delinquency film, pitching its restless hero Jim, called Jimbo by his alcoholic father, into an affluent California high school milieu of anxiety, conflict, and despair. Dean's riveting performance as the rebel Jim was set against visually exotic Los Angeles locations like the Observatory in Griffith Park, and Sal Mineo's tragic sacrificial death at the end of the film made a deep impression on Jimmy. 
Rebel Without a Cause also began Jim Morrison's deep and obsessive love of movies, and his often stated desire to learn how to make them. Rebel is the first film mentioned in Jim's surviving notebooks. He also mentions Giant, James Dean's next film, released the following year after Dean's death in a car crash. It's also possible that the movies, especially the westerns that flooded American theaters in the 50s, played a crucial role in moving Jim to write. His first poem, Pony Express, now lost, was probably based on a Hollywood western that he caught at a Saturday afternoon matinee while living in Alameda. It was definitely in Alameda that Jim Morrison first caught the beatnik poetry virus, which infected him for the rest of his life. From 1956 to 1958, the Morrisons lived in a big shingled house with an Edwardian turret at 1717 Alameda Avenue in the leafy island suburb of Alameda, the site of the Navy's biggest air station. It was a relatively quiet time in Jim's life. His mother was very content there and was fondly remembered by neighbors, and was subsequently proved to be highly influential in terms of Jim's artistic aspirations. Jim lived by himself in an attic room at the top of the old house, listening to Elvis and Ricky Nelson, while downstairs his mother played her own music, Harry Belafonte, Frank Sinatra, and the original cast albums from South Pacific and My Fair Lady. Jim was popular in school, darkly handsome and no longer chubby, friendly and very funny, able to banter with teachers who were impressed with the reading level and intelligence rarely encountered in young teenagers. At 13, Jim's favorite writer was Norman Mailer, and he could roll out entire Mad Magazine parodies from memory. Yet his school records indicate his teacher's frustrations at Jim's hyperactivity, and in some classes, he was forced to sit alone so he wouldn't bother the other students or disrupt the class with his loud interjections and joke accents. Inspired by Mad and the other satiric magazines of the new sick humor genre, Cracked, Sick, Thrump, etc., Jim's notebook sketches became wilder and more deeply cynical. He specialized in obscene drawings of people with surgically exaggerated sexual organs, obsessively inking in bodily fluids. Jimmy spent hours in his quiet attic room cutting and pasting comics into ever more complex lewd collages, relettering the text, going the sick humor mags one step further. His best friend in Alameda was a street-smart neighbor his age, Fudd Ford, who was as reckless and fun-loving as Jimmy was. Jim had access to the Navy's gyms, pools, and athletic facilities, and the boys would get into trouble on the diving board at the officer's club swimming pool and embarrass the family. Ford said that Jimmy's father beat him with his belt for one of these incidents when some officers' wives felt they'd been insulted. All the streets in Alameda led down to the beach. So in the warm months, there was a lot of swimming and clowning around. There was a pretty girl they used to go swimming with. Jimmy discovered a way to sneak into her family's boathouse so they could watch her change into her swimsuit. In September of 1957, Jimmy started the ninth grade at Alameda High. He made the swim team, specializing in the butterfly stroke. He was good in class and always had the answers even though he never put his hand in the air. He was a charismatic clown, a troublemaker, very funny and loud, a clever mimic and practical joker whose gratting outrageous pranks caused Morrison stories to float around the school 10 years before they surfaced in the media. One of his favorite stunts was to pretend to collapse on the staircase at school and lie there, unconscious, while the others had to step around him. He did this a lot at Alameda, and apparently kept it up at his next school since it was a major attention grabber. It was like Jimmy's big joke. Classmates recalled that Jimmy would actually lie there a long time, according to Fudd Ford, pretending he was dead, seemingly oblivious to attempts to rouse him. When he was satisfied that the game was played out, he'd pick himself and his books up off the floor, accept the inevitable detention ticket from the hall monitors, and carry on with his usual smirk and swagger. But was this really a joke? Or was this Jimmy's method of faking his way through a mortifying disorder that left him prostrate on the floor with embarrassing minutes lost from his life? Or was it what the ancients called the falling sickness, the malade of kings and prophets? Anyone familiar with Jim Morrison's later life and career knows that losing consciousness and passing out was a regular occurrence for him. He fainted or fell down during rehearsals, recording sessions, photo shoots. He collapsed during concerts, poetry readings, bar crawls. He passed out on car rides, in airports, and during plane trips. Chattering theatrical collapses were incorporated into the Door Stage Act, a drama Jim Morrison later refined into the apex of rock theater. Was it all really an act? Put together, the anecdotal and visual evidence could suggest that Jim Morrison suffered an undiagnosed case of petit mal epilepsy that may have begun at the age of 14, if not earlier. In high school, it cost him a lot of time in the principal's office, and everyone talked about Jim Morrison and all the funny, outrageous stuff he liked to pull. Jim started 10th grade in the fall of 1958, but he preferred to cut school and visit beatnik hangouts in San Francisco. The year earlier, two significant events had shaken America. First, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the first satellite to orbit the Earth. This sensational event provoked spasms of American self-doubt and recriminations about being beaten into space by the Russians. It began the so-called missile gap debate that later helped put John Kennedy in the White House. 
The second event was the publication of Jack Kerouac's second novel, On the Road, the stream of consciousness saga of existentially aware youth adrift on the vast highways and midnight streets of American cities that turned an entire generation onto the beat subculture. The book became a bestseller and media icon and cracked the corporate conformist facade of the 1950s wide open. On America's Two Coasts, Sputnik anxiety was allayed by Beatnik Cool, offering an alternative way of righteous existence in the late 50s. The Beats traced their style to French symbolist poets, existentialist philosophers, and Zen masters. Jazz, drugs, nonconformity, and Buddhism were cool. Gray flannel suits were uncool. Beat writers like Kerouac in the West Coast, William Burroughs in Paris, and Allen Ginsberg in New York became overnight cultural stars. The Beat poets were the legatees of Dylan Thomas, the brilliant Welsh poet whose magical Celtic cadences and lush imagery had spread via the new technology of long-playing phonograph records as much as through printed books, before he drank himself to death in Greenwich Village in 1953. They were also in the tradition of radical American writers like Walt Whitman and Mark Twain, and modernist poets like William Carlos Williams, with whom Ginsburg particularly identified. In the Beat universe, Paris was philosophy, New York was jazz, and San Francisco was poetry. Ginsburg called this flowering the San Francisco Renaissance. Often accompanied by bongo drummers, star beatniks could be heard declaiming in the jazz club seven nights a week. Allen Ginsberg premiered his beat epic, Howl, in San Francisco in 1955, and many of the other beats often gave public readings of new work in the coffee houses, art galleries, and bookstores. San Francisco was the third corner of the Beat International, a city where poets, not athletes, were local heroes. In San Francisco and neighboring Sausalito and North Beach, poetry ruled. When Jimmy and Fudd skipped school and headed into the city, their first stop was usually Ferlinghetti's City Lights book at 261 Columbus Avenue. A sign in the window boasted banned books. Jimmy liked to hang out there in his beatnik uniform of sweatshirt, sandals, and jeans, hoping to meet any of the poets who might show up. Once Jimmy said hello to Ferlinghetti, and when the poet and the author of A Connie Island of the Mind returned his greeting, Jimmy turned red with pleasure. He and Fudd would go to Stairway Records in Oakland to buy Dylan Thomas LPs on Cademon or comedy albums by Tom Lyre or Lenny Brents. Fudd took Jimmy to Duo Records, an R&B record store in Oakland, where Jimmy first heard Chicago blues stars Muddy Waters and Helen Wolf, and New Orleans legends like Professor Longhair. Jimmy and Fudd read On the Road and plunged into its beat generation dreams. Jimmy fell in love with Dean Moriarty's ferocious American energy and Kerouac's concept of Dean as one of the mad ones, the ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time, the ones who never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but burn, burn, burn like fabulous Roman candles exploding like spiders across the stars. He practiced Dean's speed adled laugh, he he he, until it made his mother nuts. Jimmy's facial hair began to grow, and he tried to develop a proper beatnik goatee until his mother ordered him to shave it off and get a haircut too. She would shout at Jim and he'd just laugh at her. Once she went to grab him and he put her into a headlock and, still laughing, grabbed the pen and scribbled on her arm. Even Clara had to laugh at this. You don't fight fair, she yelled at her son. As the school year progressed, Jimmy kept up his serial provocations. Because he was so funny and had this weird presence, he was the kind of kid who could get away with being a jerk and no one would want to call him on it. But he also had an unexpected, compassionate side. He had a classmate, Richard Slaymaker, who was seriously ill with leukemia. Jimmy liked to visit him after school, bringing him comics and comedy records to keep his spirits up. He'd take Richard for walks in his wheelchair and do wheelies with him. It seemed to Fudd that Jimmy, who was fascinated with death, was almost studying Richard as the disease progressed and his skin turned different colors. When he died after six months of almost daily visits, Jim Morrison cried. Late in 1958, halfway through the school year, Steve Morrison was promoted to captain and reassigned. His parents told Jimmy that the family was moving to Alexandria, Virginia, right after Christmas. According to Fudd Ford, Jimmy was crushed and didn't want to go. On the last day of classes, Ford said Jimmy walked up to the homeroom teacher's desk and announced that his family was moving away and that he wanted to leave with a bang. Then he lit a cherry bomb and sauntered out of the room before it exploded. Jimmy came over to Fudd's house to say goodbye on the day the Morrisons left Alameda. Then Jimmy got in the captain's ugly green Picard and didn't look back as his father pulled away. Fudd Ford would later recall, Jimmy felt bad because he didn't want to go to Virginia. It was one of the few times in my childhood that I cried. They were taking my best friend away. Jimmy was sent to Virginia ahead of the rest of the family so he could resume high school there in January of 1959. For a few weeks, he stayed with the Morehouse family, who had a son, Jeff, his own age. It would be five years before Jimmy was able to return to his beloved California for good. 